pause for thought and join in the barking with Darren Rowe on The Mindful Dog. It is time to talk animals, dogs in particular. I just have to log back into my computer. Sorry, people. Um, my computer system here has got this great little thing where it just decides randomly in the middle of doing something to log me out. And... Uh, that's always a good time. So then I can't look at my notes of what I've got going on and what's coming up. But we're back in now and it's time to talk with Darren Rowe, Mindfulness for Dogs, coming to us live from our Hamilton studios. Morning to you, Darren. Good morning. You've just got to love computers, haven't you? Oh, it, I don't know what is on with this. It, it, this computer here, literally 10 seconds before I go on air every morning on a Sunday, <laughs> it will log me out and I'm frantically logging in. And it's just logged me out there. It's not like it's not being used. I was using it three seconds beforehand so uh, yeah it's a good time who loves computers I love computers <laughs> uh, so last week we started talking about crate training and we didn't walk we did. and we didn't really get too far because we, we had didn't. so many questions no. now Which I've, was got great. A, I've got a couple <laughs> of questions already so what I thought we should do is get to the questions and then we'll go back to the crate yeah. um, and if you do have a question for Darren Rowe mindfulness for dogs about your dog's behavior now is your chance to get it in too 0800 844 747 is the number to call 3920 is the text and uh, we are taking your calls and your text as well so here we go to the dog man I quite like that uh, Probably they used to call me Darren the dog man when I was in the UK many years ago Darren the dog man so I would have yeah. trademarked that if I was you Darren I think I bought the website actually <laughs> I would have what can I do to make my dog stop digging holes in my garden and digging out my flower plants from Marie Wow, that's that's an age-old thing, isn't it? You got to remember, dogs digging is, um, you know, it's a natural behaviour. They love it, absolutely adore it. Um, what we tend to do is we tend to give them a place to dig, um, and we train them to dig in that area. So we hide all sorts of really nice chew, you know, chew toys and all that kind of stuff in a certain area. And every time we see a dog digging where they shouldn't do, we kind of usher them over to that area and make a real big thing of yes, you're allowed to do that in this area, and then they get a reward, they get a chew toy. And over time, that encourages the dog to go and dig over there and not everywhere else. But obviously, the, the more, especially with the plants, if you if your dog watches you sort of garden and watches you dig up and everything, they're just copying you. They learn a lot by social sort of interactions, social learning. Mm-hmm. So if they see you dig in a certain area, then of course you can dig there, can't you? <laughs> so, yeah, put your dogs away when you're doing gardening. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that one. That. Yeah. Good luck with that one. Uh, another question too says, I have a six-month-old spaniel pup who is uh, around dogs and other people a lot. I'm considering adopting a nine-year-old lab whose owner has passed on. What's the best way to introduce the dogs successfully? Oh, it's a really difficult one. You, you, Gosh, there's so much to think about there. You need to understand the... The personality, I guess, guess of the older dog. Um, it's better, probably, in my experience, to bring an older dog into a younger dog family. Which is um, what's happening here by the looks yeah, of things. Yeah, which, which, because a young, but it just depends on the dog. Um, spaniels are quite excitable. The Labradors, they're probably quite excitable at six years um, still as well. Um, just take it very slowly. Um, Meet first of all in neutral territory. I know people dog trainers say that all the time, but it's really important you do that so you don't get any resource guarding and 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 do do it very slowly because the last thing you want is to bring an older dog in and then that older dog to feel intimidated by your puppy, or vice versa, um, because it's it's no fun when you get it wrong. Believe me, then you've got this physical management that you've got to sort out all the time. So very very slowly, and and I would probably get a trainer just to just to guide you, phone up someone locally and try and get some advice from someone. 0800 844 747 is the number if you have a question for uh, Mindfulness for Dogs, Darren Rowe, animal or canine behaviourist. Our Maltese Shih Tzu barks at cars going past when out walking. How can we stop this? So that's a fear-based um, behaviour and that would be down to lack of socialisation and a lack of exposure of those kind of things when the puppy was young. So, so they're quite scared and they're quite motivated by that movement. Um, if you think about it, it's, they're, they're very small dogs, aren't they? So they're on the ground and, and then this massive great big thing comes whizzing past at high speed and they probably haven't even seen it come towards them and suddenly it's there. So it's quite scary. So, so when, we, when we kind of retrain that kind of thing, we, we need to be thinking about the distance. If you think about when you're on the pathway, it's quite close to the car. So you want to be training that at a bigger distance. So try and find somewhere. We, we quite often stand by a roundabout, but quite out of the way, a very quiet roundabout, and just watch the cars go around, give them lots of treats. Make sure they see the car before you treat them so that they um, actually associate the, the positive treat with the car, if that makes sense, not the other way around. Um, and that way they'll start to build a positive association of the cars and then slowly increase the intensity so they get closer and closer to the to the roadside. Personally, if I had a dog that was reacting to cars like that, I wouldn't be walking that dog out 
anywhere near cars until I've sorted that behaviour out because it ain't going to get any better if we don't train it. Yeah, and that could get quite annoying too, having <clears throat> yeah. a little dog barking at cars all the time. Our it's quite dog... bad for the dog as well. It's very stressful. It's not a good place to live in. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. Uh, here's another question for you. Our dog has recently been to the kennels and... They said she's not invited back because she was Ooh. so anxious. She was not wanting to play with with other dogs and just wanted to go inside. Is there anything we can do to change this? Yeah, well, first of all, I'd be looking at the kennel structure that you're taking your dog to. So um, kennels have changed over the last few years. And, and with the um, sort of opening of doggy daycares, this, this assumption that when you take a dog to a kennel, they have to be part of the doggy daycare as well. Um, I don't take my dogs to kennels where there's a doggy daycare. I don't want them interacting with other people's dogs. And I mean that quite sort of nicely. Mm-hmm. But I want my dogs to go into the kennels and come out the same as they went in. I don't want any bad experiences to happen with my dogs whilst I'm not there. So I, would be, I wouldn't worry too much about that. I, I mean, it might be an issue that you need to look at down the line, but I would be thinking, well, let's put my dog in a kennel where it's by itself. It doesn't need to be anxious with other dogs. OK, that's so that's, that that's acceptable one. to have your dog on your own in the kennel? Definitely, they don't yeah, have to yeah. do any excess well, socialising? No, they're probably at home by themselves most of the time anyway, aren't they? Yeah, and I know what I'm like. I wouldn't want to be playing out and hanging out with everyone all the time. In fact, I quite like my own company. Exactly. Perhaps too much, <laughs> some might say. We, we, we put a lot of pressure on our dogs without realising, and actually if our dog's not used to that kind of social interactions all the time, because that's like 24-7, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, then why put them in that situation when it's already stressful because they're not with us? Yeah, fair enough. Imagine yeah. yourself in that situation. It will be exhausting. Mm. 0800 844 747 is the number if you've got a question about your dog and your dog's behaviour for Darren or 3920 is the text. Let's get on to crates, which we touched on last week, but we didn't really cover off. So what is the story with crates? Yeah, so so quite often people think of crates as prisons. And um, I want to kind of kick that one to touch, really, if I can use a rugby term. It was a good game, wasn't it, as well? Mm. Um, Wow, it was fine, good. Yeah, but it was. We won. We won. We won. (laughs) Um, yeah, so so crates are, are really, really important when it comes to dog training. And most people just give them a little bit of lip service, I guess. We use crates for the whole of the dog's lives. And um, we've got crates everywhere, pretty much. And the dogs will just go in their crates when they feel like it, because it's a nice place to go. But we work really hard on making that crate the best place in the world for a dog to want to be. And I, I'd even go as far as to say that that's the difference between a good dog trainer or a good dog trainer's dogs and just a normal person who's training a dog Um, because they know they have a place where they can go and chill out so they can be relaxed and then they can work and then go back and chill out and you can teach your dog that emotional sort of control you switch off you switch on and that's something that I see is lacking in so many dogs they're just constantly running around the house constantly on alert constantly charged you know and there's just no calm no calm down uh, no calm time until they go to sleep so, mm. first of all, that's the first reason why we get a crate, definitely. The second reason is that we can actually use crates to train. We can teach motivational games through crates. There's a, um, I've talked about it before, but um, Susan Garrett, she's got a whole thing on crate games, so you can actually teach your dogs to do all sorts of things, driving out of crates, driving into crates. Absolutely fantastic fun. We do that all the time with our dogs. Um, <clears throat> so, so it's not just a, a place to put your dog when the dog's naughty. I think that's the most important thing. In fact, it's never a place to put your dog when your dog's naughty. It's not a punishment. So many people look at crates too. Uh, uh, I guess it's changing slightly now, and we're like, oh, we can't put our dog in a in a box. That's not fair to the dog. Yeah, yeah. but if you think about a dog, um, if you think about when dogs are puppies, if you think of the wild dogs, and there's many, not that many of them at the moment, but think about the wild dogs. The pups are in a, um, a den, aren't they? Right, and that's what they're used to. They like to go underground. You've only got to look at a dog that gets stressed out by fireworks. Where do they go? They go under the bed. They go under the sofa, all those kind of things. Somewhere really dark. So, so we make our pens a den, effectively, for the dog. So we put blankets over it. We put chew toys in there. We make it a really nice place for them to want to go. But it's nice and calm and dark. And, and it kind of mirrors that den-like. And I think it probably sort of makes them think they're puppies again. They certainly come out quite happy. Um, so that's the first thing to think about, really. Make sure it's a really nice, calm place, dark. Mm, a nice, so happy sure. place. Yeah. If you have a question for Darren Rowe, now is your chance to get it in 0800 844 747. 3920 is the text, but give us a call 0800 844 747. The Sunday Cafe with Mel Homer. Got something to add? Call 0800 844 747. Magic talk. So Darren, with crates, uh, what about, can they help with toilet training in any way? Yeah, so so. Conventionally, we think of um, crates as um, toilet training. 
basically. Um, so we put our dog in a crate, um, we close the door, and then we leave them in there for 10 minutes, and then we take them back out and see if they want to go to the toilet. And if they don't, we put them back in the crate, close the door again. And, and that's really been in the realms of puppy training, but you can use that exactly that same principle in for any age dog. If you've got a rescue dog, the first thing I do is crate train them. Um, toilet train, crate train. Um, and the idea is that they just keep going back in that crate until they are so desperate to go to the loo that they will go outside and then you kind of promote that behaviour and then do the same thing again and again. It takes a bit of time, but it's well worth doing something like that. There's loads of protocols you can find on the internet for that kind of stuff. Um, but it's not just um, toilet training, because what normally happens is then people will train the toilet training, the, t- the dog is toilet trained, and then they take the crate away. So I always try and sort of argue with people that you know if you've got a young child always bring back to young children because people can um sort of relate to that but if you have a young child and then you give them a bedroom you don't take it away from them when they're a year old i mean that would be horrendous can you Mm. imagine the fights you'd have Mm. so we give this place this really nice place where a dog feels really comfortable really secure and then we just take it away (laughs) just because it doesn't look as nice in the front room or it's you know (laughs) not the best place so dogs should have their crates for life yeah, we, we, we've got our, our garage. We no longer have cars in our garage. It's just so many crates. Obviously, lots of dogs. You have lots of crates. So we've just got crates in the garage, and that's where they go. And little Lala, who's one of our rescue dogs, she she's not very good at coping with the world. And um, if she can't deal with things, she just disappears for a few hours at a time. And, and if you go into the garage, you'll see her just sleeping in her crate because that's the place where she goes when she's a bit stressed out. That's her safe spot. Yeah. And what sort of size should you be looking at for your dog? I mean, how much room do they need in their crate? Yeah, so, so they, they come in different sizes, obviously, um, and different makes will be different sort of um, sizes. But generally speaking, you want your dog to be able to stand up and do a turn and then lie down because you don't, you know, they don't have to have huge amounts of room because you're not going to leave them in there for hours and hours and hours a day. And mm. if you do sort of put your dog in a crate and then go out for six hours, when don't get upset when your dog doesn't like being in their crate. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Have a pen around that. But, um, yeah, they've just got to really be able to stand up turn around and then lie down completely so the bigger your dog the bigger the crate um our irish setters we've got humongous crates um and the border collies are slightly smaller um, Mm. they don't need as much what else can you use a crate for yeah so um you can actually use a crate for uh well it's your imagination really so so we teach our we teach our dogs to go into the crates and then come out and then go in and they choose to go in themselves okay um and the reason we do that is then when when we put a blanket in there then they're going out and then coming back into their blanket and then that blanket becomes a bed outside and then they learn to stay on their bed if that makes sense so mm. we use a crate to to teach the go to bed command if you want to call it that not that we tell them to um the go to bed command and stay there and um, because you've got the door there you can teach the dog that when you touch the door the dog sits automatically and that's like um, classical conditioning that as soon as the hand goes on that they sit that can then be taken out to you hold the door handle in the front door and the dog sits you hold the door handle of the car and the dog sits so they can start to transfer all those behaviors so so it's more about transferable behaviors when in the crate really um you imagine you know whatever you want to think about you can use a crate to help you we do agility and we have two crates have you ever seen the dog walk and the a-frames the yes. things that they climb up so we have crates at either end and we teach the dog to sit in one of them and then we break them and they run out and they drive over the dog walk in the a-frame and then go back into the other crate huh. so you've got that transfer of value between the crates that they really love and then the dog walk so yeah so so much you can do with a crate if you've got more <laughs> than one dog should you have specific crates for them or should they share uh we we have every dog has their own crates not that they um the collies are terrible we feed them in the crates as well which is um i think one of the really important things that builds so much value for the crate but dinner time's hilarious in our house um this morning because they jump in and out of each other's crates and then they get really angry with each other so that's my crate that's my crate (laughs) it's quite funny (laughs) oh my goodness hey we've got some questions coming through uh let's address them i'm a dog lover but my neighbor recently adopted a middle-aged dog which constantly barks at me when i'm in the garden (coughs) what can i do so that i can go into the garden without the dog barking and prowling by the fence when I'm in the garden. It's from Joe. Yeah, so, so first of all, have a chat with your neighbour because you don't want to be doing anything to that dog unless your neighbour knows because, again, if you're using any treats or giving it any sort of rewards, then you need to make sure it's, it's acceptable for that owner and the dog because they might have sort of problems with their stomach, stuff like that. But really, it's about that positive association. Dogs... Dogs sometimes, and if it's a rescue dog, it might have a bit of a protective instinct there, so it might be guarding that fence line. Um, so 
probably I would be talking to the owner and saying, can I come around, have a chat with a dog? If it's a nice dog, don't put yourself in uh, danger, obviously. Safety is important. But just start to build a positive association and giving the dog some treats. And then maybe you can give a dog a treat through the fence or just throw a treat over the fence for the dog. As long as they can see you and then the treat comes, then they'll associate you with a treat. And, and over time, that will just build value. It's just trust, isn't it? The dog doesn't trust you because doesn't know you. Mm. As soon as they trust that you're not going to hurt them or their owner, then they'll be fine. So make sure the dog associates you with the treat, yeah. not that you are the treat. Yeah, yes, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> but have that have that conversation with the owner and get their buy in. It's really important you do that. Another question in uh, morning. I have a two year old Alaskan Malamute. He's entire and will stay so. Came from Adelaide at eight weeks. He's one of the four original Alaskan Malamute breeds. He's really big and loving. He's just become food aggressive. How can we help with this? Even though he was taught from day one not to be, is it age and territory? He's with three huskies, full run of a couple acres, but he's happy to kennel crate with thanks. Yeah. um, Did you say he was two years old? Yeah, he's two years old. Yeah. Um, it's not a breed I know a great deal about, I have to admit. Um, not one you see in New Zealand very often. Um, I have certainly haven't seen in New Zealand very often. Um, I would say there's a, there's definitely sort of resource guarding um, development there. If he hasn't done it before, it's probably because the situation's changed within the little family. And it might be that you want to be thinking about giving more distance when you feed them, just so that you're not making that worse. Um, the one thing that we think when, when we have a, a food-related resource guarding is what the dog trainer would call it um <clears throat> if the dog is feeling that the other dogs can take the treats or take the food away then he's going to get more of more guarding over that resource so you need to take that away from him so he feels confident feels happy that he's not going to get his food stolen yeah otherwise that will escalate so you definitely feed them separately we, we tend to feed in the crates like i said earlier um and we've got one dog that will be fed on one side of the room in a crate and the others are all fed together because they're okay but she's a resource guarder she came to us as a resource guarder it's not something you get rid of it's something you manage so um, as long as there's food not around she's perfect stick food in there we give her a separate place to be mm. Are there any tips on getting dogs not to pull on a leash? I have a 50 <laughs> kilo bull mastiff. If he pulls so much, it's hard to walk him. Yeah. So, so first thing to think about, this is that I get this all the time. This is probably the biggest thing that people phone me for. Um, the size makes no difference. You could be pulled down the road by a little chihuahua, and I see people being pulled down the road by little chihuahuas just as much as 50 k dogs, believe me. It's all in the mind. The dog has to want to know, or has to want to be with you, right? So it has to, to know that where you want the dog to be. <clears throat> so, so what we do is we, um, we make down by our leg, Again, really important. Same thing, we transfer values of treats to that position. So we treat them lots in that position, and we're very precise in the position that we treat them because we want them to be in a certain place, yeah? And we just keep doing that from, from an early puppy, right? But it doesn't matter. You just have to keep doing it over and over again. And then the dog starts to think, oh, maybe this is a good place to be. Maybe I'll hang around there. The other thing is you don't want to treat them in front of you. So we don't treat our dog for a sit anymore because just by definition, we're treating, we're adding all that value to the position in front of us. And then when we put them on a the lead, we want them by our side. Mm. So kind of like hmm. screwing ourselves up there, yeah? Um, if you think of dog behavior as a balancing scales, I tend to use this one a lot, um, there's, we, at the moment, we've got so much value in the front so the dogs, the scales are balanced incorrectly we need to keep adding value to the other side start tipping it in our favor so it's going to take time because there might be a lot of value in the behavior we don't want but if you keep working then you'll find that will tip the scales in the right way and then you'll see the improvements but you've got to be patient and mm. consistent and do you start doing that sort of thing when you're out not when you're out walking you do that before no so, so we spend a lot of time doing that in the house when it's really calm again foundation behaviors are at very low level then we start to take it out a little bit more and see if we can get the same behavior if we can't we go back again go back inside um, and we just keep building that in fact i was doing that with um star who is an amazing walker um we were in cambridge and they're just completely uh, demolishing the um uh, petrol station there and there's so much noise that he just lost it completely so i had to go right back to doing the same behaviors again just to get some kind of idea that he could actually walk properly on the lead he didn't know what he was doing <laughs> got so scared so yeah so constantly doing that if you've got a question for darren a canine behaviorist 0800 844 747 is a number you can text as well if you want 3920 maria asks uh, my dog i don't know if you'll be able to help with this one my dog from time to time vomits yellow bile what does that mean okay you need to speak to a vet Mm. Definitely. And um, there's a whole load of things about puke. I could do a whole um, podcast on puke. <laughs> and the different colours mean something very specific. So I would 
but yeah, definitely if you're unsure, I would go and get um, some advice on the bet there. Even just a phone call, they'll tell you, oh, don't you know, it's just bile or something like that. But mm. um, yeah, anything like that, it's not a behavioural thing. They've eaten something they shouldn't do, and there might be all sorts of other things associated with it. Yep, so you want to um, get that checked out. One, one last thing about that lead walking, uh, Mel, you don't control a dog by using lead. You control a dog by the dog choosing to be with you. You're just blowing everything out, aren't you, today? It's like yeah. you're making all these things <laughs> that we've just assumed for years and you're going, well, no, actually, that's not the way it works. The, the lead is safety in case it all goes wrong. Um, I was walking down the road yesterday with Star and Twinkle doing some work and the lead was attached and it was just over my neck, just dangling, okay? Mm-hmm. And they were making the choice to be with me. If they didn't, then my lead came in close and I could bring them back, but... Generally speaking, 80% of the time, they were just walking quite nicely by me until this um, little dog in the cafe suddenly decided to attack to Corbin. That's besides the point. <laughs> have a little yip and have a bit of a crack. That's always, it's always the little dogs. Uh, if you've got a question for Darren, 0800 844 747, and we do have one on the line. Oh, hey, Jude, was... morning. You are on with Darren. Hi, Jude. Yeah, hi. Brilliant program. It's very, very oh, interesting. Um, <clears throat> I have an 18-month-old German wirehead pointer cross with Labrador. Yep. I've had him since a pup. Brilliant to train, um, but just lately, um, if we get visitors or even with me or my husband, he wants to jump up. I just put my knee up, walk away. Um, if it's inside, I'll put him out and shut the door. Um, and if he comes and <coughs> does it again, I'd do it again. Is there yeah. something else I should be doing? Um, so just, just by chance, he hasn't um, started going to a daycare or anything recently, has he? No, no. Um, oh, I live okay. in the country. Um, oh, we okay. go for walks five, basically five kilometres um, pretty well every day. Um, I have breaks, so then he doesn't expect that he is going to go for a walk every day. OK, fair enough. Um, the reason I say that is because sometimes at daycares they're jumping on other dogs and stuff and that behaviour starts to come back. Um, no, no, I don't, was... don't go daycare at all. No, so, so probably what's happened is without realising you've rewarded the behaviour. And when, when, when we think about rewarding, it's if we touch them, we look at them, we speak to them, we praise them, we give them a treat or anything that motivates the dog, and that can be very specific to a dog, that will reward and reinforce that behaviour jumping up. And it might not have even been you, it might have been your visitors coming in and pushing them down or telling them to get off. That will start to re- reinforce that behaviour. So it's got to be a no sort of um, contact policy on that sense, yeah? Um, and... The other thing is he, he probably doesn't have a job. It's quite a natural behaviour jumping up to people because that's what puppies do to older dogs, isn't it, yeah? Um, so it's quite a natural behaviour. So what we need to do is give him another job. So what I would do is I would I would double that back and think about lead walking and I would put him in that position to the side. So every time someone comes, I'd put him on a lead, I'd bring him to you on the side and put him in a sit and then start treating him and rewarding that behaviour and saying, look, this is what I want you to do when someone comes in. <clears throat> that way you're teaching him where you want him to be when someone's there, but also you're helping yourself with the lead walking. Yeah, because when, when, when we go walk, we don't see anybody because I live in a country and I take mm. him down uh, a dead-end metal road, a farm okay, road, yeah. so and I let all, him yeah. run around there. That's his free area. Yeah, still, still um, a good idea to do to do that because you're giving him a job when someone comes in. Remember, Labs are really sociable dogs, so you know that's the natural instinct to, to jump and say hello to people. Um, just be a bit careful with the turning away and, and walking off. You're not telling your dog what to do. You're just saying, I don't like the behaviour you're doing. So make sure you're actually giving him a job to do as well. Otherwise, he's not going to really know what to do. Quite often, we tell our dogs what we don't want, but we never tell them what we do want. Hey, thanks so much for your call, Jude. Yeah. It's nearly time to wrap up. I think before we do it's that, it's quick. just very... I know, didn't it? Let's just talk very quickly about the crates. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? We've got to finish it up. We're finishing it this week, okay? Long-term thing. <laughs> We're not doing this for another six months. <laughs> what, with, what if they don't like the crates? What do you do? Yeah, so so if they don't like the crates, it depends on the age, but quite often um, they don't like the crates because we've made them a very negative place, basically. So, so it just goes back to that same thing. If you introduce the crates slowly, so we have the crate wide open, but there's, get one with two doors. Dogs like to know they can go in one and out the other. So have those doors open, leave it there for as long as you can, treat them in there, feed them in there, play, play with them in there, all those kind of things. So they just naturally decide to go in. Once they naturally decide to go in, then you know the dog's fine. But as soon as you throw them in there because they're being naughty, then that's going to start giving it a negative slant, yeah? You can, you can put a dog in there when they've been naughty. I'm not saying you don't, but don't put your emotional state on it. So, you know, just put them in there calmly. Go outside, scream your head off, but don't 
see them. Don't let the dogs see you that they're going in there because it's a cool place to be and you just need some calm time, yeah? Um, <laughs> Mummy needs some downtime. <laughs> yeah, got it. yeah, well, the dog doesn't know it's done anything wrong, does it? As far as the dog's concerned, the behaviours are very appropriate. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> so, that's a very yeah. valid point. <laughs> OK, well, hey, that was fun and I'm glad we finally got through crates um, and a lot of enlightening information there as well. Darren, thank you so much. Have a wonderful week. Been a pleasure, thank you. And if you would like to get in contact with Darren, you know you can just head to Mindfulness for Dogs and you can throw questions at him and ask him whatever you like through Facebook or on his website too, mindfulnessfordogs.com. You've been listening to Darren Rowe on the Mindful Dog, giving our canine friends a voice throughout the world. To find out more about what we do, visit our website at www.mindfulnessfordogs.com.